The kids, could you guys just come right on up here? You can sit in the front pew. Kids, come on up, kids. I want to talk to the kids for a couple of minutes. Hi, guys. You guys can have a seat right here. Did you want to come, Haley? Nope. Okay. I, I could use a fourth kid. There we go. God is so good. I needed four kids for this. Welcome, guys. I'm so glad you're here today. Yeah, and so we're excited to see what you're going to have to say on your kids' coloring contest. But I had a message for you today that God gave me. And I want to ask you guys, because this is something I think about a lot. You guys know I think about cars a lot. You guys like cars, right? I hope so, because we talk about them a lot, don't we, in kids' <laughs> class? So you guys have ridden in cars before, right? Yeah, like today maybe even. Like, oh, you guys are so great. Thanks. Oh, thanks, guys, for giving him that experience. I know that was a silly question, wasn't it? You know, um, we have all, I know what, we've all ridden in cars sometime or another, and um, that kind of gives us a little bit, we kind of know something about them just because we all ride in cars, like almost every day in our culture we do. So cars are a great means of transportation, right? Gets us there pretty fast. It's great because somebody else is driving. Maybe you guys will be driving really soon. Um, now, um, don't even think about that. We'll be praying for you. <laughs> now, I want you guys to think for just a second about um, what kind of car you would like to be if you could be a car. Oh, Titus knows already. I can tell. I will, I'm going to show you a couple pictures. So I want you guys to help me out here. So... Um, Armando, can you stand up and hold up this picture so everybody can see this? Oh, this is really groovy. There you go. This is a really cool car. This is a beauty, and it's fast, too. Can you hold it up so everybody can see it? This is a Corvette Z06 2016 model in red. It is so cool. It goes uh, 0 to 60 in 2.95 seconds. Awesome, huh? And um, it also, I thought this was really great, it has 650 horsepower with 650 uh, uh, torque, 650 pound-feet of torque. That's a lot. I know that's a lot because I have a car and it's like not even close to that. Um, this is a great, great car. And so, you know, sports cars like this are kind of like movie stars of cars, right? They're like famous. But the problem is they don't last long because of the nature of them uh, going so fast and being driven pretty hard. Okay, so I have another car. Um, hey, Titus, I think you'd like this one. You want to hold this one up? All right, here you go. Yeah, you like that one, don't you? Okay, this is a solid, solid work truck. They're like the workhorses of the car world. Trucks are built to last, and they are strong as an ox, and if you hit one, you are in trouble. In most cases, trucks don't give up until the job is done. They're not always pretty, but they are tough. So I have one more car. Carrie, you want to hold this one up? Here you go. Okay, so you guys, yeah, here we go. Here's a vehicle we all know and love. This is a minivan. It is the most common car in America. You see them everywhere. Probably you guys don't drive one. Don't raise your hand. We don't want to know. Um, these babies are along the most, they're the most useful vehicles. You can get a ton of kid stuff in a minivan and they're used on a daily ba basis. So have you guys decided what kind of car you might like to be? Probably, I know Titus thought about it instantly. But what do all of these cars have in common? What do you guys think these cars have in common? They're vehicles. Yeah, that's right. They have wheels, right. They get you from point A to point B. Oh, they have like a motor in them. That's really great, yeah. That, that's a really helpful thing unless you live on a steep hill. And then, yeah. So you're right, Carrie. She's right. It has to have a motor in it. So what? Oh, yeah. Brakes. Brakes are good. 
Brakes are very good, yeah. Especially, yeah, if you get rear-ended. So, um, so can you hold this one up? So Ella has another car. <laughs> so eventually, all of these cars, no matter how amazing they are, might need Ella's car. Because one thing that cars have in common is they wear out and they break down and they have to be taken to the shop and they need maintenance. Sometimes they get flat tires, right guys? You've seen that. Carrie was with me when, when my car broke down. Um, and so um, all the cars, all of these cars will end up in a junkyard someday unless somebody maintains them or restores them, right? And in some ways, our lives are like these cars that we talked about today. There's a lot of different types of cars, like there's many types of people. Some people are glamorous, um, some are workers, and some are just everyday people like that minivan. And some people, I think, are tow trucks too. They help other people as well. Just as all cars break down, all people share a common problem which causes us to wear out and eventually die. And that problem is called sin. Just as a car, these cars, if they get dented or hurt or get a flat tire, they cannot fix themselves. And we are the same way. When we sin and fall short of the glory of God, we cannot fix ourselves. But we have good news because we know someone who can. Yeah, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These guys know this verse, John 3, 16. And it is, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's right. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Jesus will restore our fellowship with God no matter what we do, no matter how badly we get wrecked when we're on the back of a tow truck. Jesus loves us and wants to restore us to God. And he wants us to live with him for all of eternity. So, Father God, I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, and especially these kids, would want to be restored every day new as a new creation with Christ Jesus. We thank you for this time we've had. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Give them a hand. They did a great job. Thanks, guys. Well, as you can see, we're doing things a little bit different today. Um, Pastor Jeff is out sick today, so we are doing what we do, and that is serving Jesus no matter what it looks like. Um, so I have a, a, a message that God wanted me to share with you. You guys know that we love cars. You figured that out, right? And we belong to a car club, and we're so interested in restoration of cars, and we're also devoted to restoration of people through our Lord Jesus Christ. But have, has anybody here ever done any type of restoration to like a car or your home or even like moved, you know, where you're kind of restoring your closets and you're putting your stuff in boxes and yeah, lots of people, uh-huh. It is a big job, isn't it? It is a very big job and kind of when you're in the middle of the whole thing, you start doubting uh, if it's worth it. Sometimes you doubt if you're even sane in the middle of all of that. And one thing that you learn really fast is that it always, 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 or probably almost always, costs more than you think and takes more time than you think. Am I right on that? Oh yeah, we got a lot of amens on that one. And I want to tell you a love story today of a restoration project that Bob and I did. Um, can we get that first slide up? Thank you. Um, 
This is such a sweet story. These are my grandparents, Bob and Elsie Clemens. I absolutely adored them, and they lived to be quite old. My Nana was 95 when she passed away. So I had a Nana, like, through most of my adulthood. She passed away just actually fairly recently in 2008. So I had her until recently, and we adored them. We adored everything about them. And I just cannot tell you how much I thank God for them being Christians because I loved them so much and they loved me unconditionally. I would have done any religion or anything that they had done, but they loved Jesus. And because I loved them so much, I also fell in love with their Savior. They led me to the Lord. And the vehicle that they have in there is actually legendary in our family. I know it's just, it's, it's not a big deal. It's a 1979 sportsman, right? Beauville, excuse me, Beauville Chevy van. It's not a big deal at all. My granddad bought it new in 1979. It was their dream. It was their dream. He got a little extra bonus money. They hardly had money ever to buy anything new, but they bought this van new and they turned it into a little camper van so that they could travel around and do ministry. And they put almost a quarter of a million miles on it in the name of Jesus. And um, a few years ago, they sold this van to some family who lived in Kentucky. My grandparents were from California. When they, my granddad couldn't drive anymore, he sold this van and it went out to Kentucky and a whole series of circumstances happened. And this van that was so beloved by all of us uh, got abandoned on a farm in Kentucky. And we never really talked about it very much, what had happened to this van. But Bob and I had always had a dream of what was their dream, which was taking a van like this and traveling around the country and doing ministry when we retire, like my grandparents did. They, I remember I was with them, and we would pull into a rest stop, and granddad would just say, Lord Jesus, we're here for a reason. Show us what it is. And they would bring people into this van and feed them and lead them to the Lord in this little van. I don't even know how many hundreds of young people and uh, people, strangers, would come to Christ as a result of this van. We had that same dream. So we would sporadically van shop and everything that we ever saw we compared it to this oh by the way it has a really romantic name it's called the tan van <laughs> <laughs> they weren't creative but but it was effective right so the tan van we compared it to the tan van we always talked about the tan van and then one day we decided to ask my aunt whatever happened to that tan van and she said, I've been so embarrassed to say anything to the family because I know how beloved it was to our family. But it's just derelict. And it's up to, you know, the wheels are buried in the mud and rats have been living in it for years. And it's just horrible. And I said, can we have it? And she said, sure. She said, if we can dig it out of the mud and you can tow it to California, you can have it. So Bob and I prayed about it and talked about it. We decided it was worth um, the price of having it towed from, from Kentucky to California just to see if he could even come back to life. Um, and so we brought it in. It was a happy and glorious day when we brought it in. Could you go to the next slide, please? I just want to show you this painting. My uncle was an artist. Excuse me, and when my granddad passed away, this van was so beloved in our family that my uncle painted a picture of it with my grandparents going off to heaven in, in the van. Isn't that sweet? And that painting, uh, The Road to Paradise, I don't know if you can see that down here at the bottom. I have a fancy gizzy I got from Bob, if I can figure it out. Right there is the sign that says Road to Paradise. Isn't that cool? Everybody knew who my grandparents were, and they knew the importance of this van. So, um, so could you go to the next slide, please? So this van, uh, this, here's the painting of the van at the top. 
and here is the van. And I, you can't really tell very much. My aunt snapped this picture when they put it on the back of the tow truck and to haul it. And it took quite some doing and a lot of shovel work to get it out of the mud. But they put it on the back of the van. And I think it's absolutely remarkable that this painting that was done maybe five or six years before is almost identical to this picture. I'm not ascribing any spiritual significance to that. But I think, <laughs> I just think that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that just shows you how important this was to us and to our family. Um, you know, my, uh, some of my family members tried to sell this van when it was in Kentucky, and nobody would even, they couldn't even sell it for the scrap value. It had so little value. It wasn't even worth just the scrap value to dig it out of the mud. The only people thought it was worth digging out of the mud was us. It didn't have any intrinsic value at all except the emotional value and the love that we had for this van but it was precious to us and even hauling it across the united states to just look at it again was worth it to us you know we loved my grandparents so dearly and we loved this really useless hunk of metal um, because we loved them it just reminded me this van and the price we paid just to get it unstuck from the mud and get it to California was daunting enough and way more than the van was worth. But it reminds me of that terrible and glorious price that Jesus Christ paid for us to get unstuck from the mud and get us hauled off to where Jesus could work on us and bring us into restoration and healing you know, there's a verse that we talked about earlier today with the kids, John 3, 16. That verse is so familiar to so many people that we kind of just rattle it off. We didn't even have to look it up because we know right where it, what it says. And that was John 3, 16. But I want us to stop and really look at that verse for a few minutes. I want you to linger on it. And, and I want you to join me with this. John 3.16. I'm going to read it to you one more time. And then we're going to go back and look at it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, Shauna and I joke around because when we go to seaport villages and places like that, my name is never on a mug. It's Lorette. And I've got way too many vowels. It's not fair. And, and Shauna's name is never on those mugs either. But you know what? My name is right here, right here in this verse. For God so loved Lorette that he gave his only son that when she believes in him, she will not perish but have eternal life. Your name is in this verse also. I would encourage you today just to take that familiar verse and really soak in that verse today. You know, one of the, the things, that, the tools that we use in children's ministry is we try to make our lessons experiential. So we try to get all their senses involved. We've been known to squirt them with water and bang pots and pans and do all kinds of crazy stuff to get the children engaged with, with um, you know, like an emotional engagement with, with whatever we're teaching them. I want to do that with us today with, with these verses I want to put us right now in this verse in John 3, 16, at the foot of the cross. Can you imagine yourself standing at the foot of the cross with Mary and John and some of the other people that were there? Could you imagine? Was it, do you think about that kind of thing? Do you put yourself in that picture? Was it hot? Was it smelly? Um... It was certainly stressful. We can imagine the stress of that. You can imagine the shock and the horror of watching someone you love, a family member even, being so abused and so helpless up on that cross and the moans and the groans of agony. You can picture that. How frightening was it when the sun suddenly eclipsed and the earth got cold? How many of you remember that eclipse a few years ago? It went, we had a total eclipse, and it was so weird, and, and it, was, it got cold, and, 
and uh, it was just frightening, and we felt off balance, and, and, uh, and it was very dark. But most of all, I wonder, could we speculate about what Jesus was thinking? We, don't, we know some of the things he said, but we don't know what he was thinking most of the time that he was hanging on the cross. You know, we talked about this at Easter time with the kids. We talked about the fact that it wasn't really nails that had his hands on that cross, and it wasn't really nails in his feet that kept him up there. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He was God. He could have had angels pull those nails out. He could have poofed the whole thing away, but he didn't because it wasn't really nails that kept him on that cross. What it was was love. And it was love for you. And it was love for me. That's what Jesus was likely thinking about on the cross. I know I'm just speculating about that. But you know, sometimes I just wonder if Jesus was thinking about me while he was up there on that cross. If he was thinking about all the sins he knew I was going to commit in my life. Was he thinking about rescuing me when he was up there on the cross? Was he thinking it was worth it? I think he was. I think he was looking at each one of our faces, knowing who we are and what we could become in him. And he was thinking up there, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it all. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Barely able to breathe in excruciating pain with his shoulders dislocated. And I am on his mind. And you were on his mind. Loving you. And keeping himself on the cross out of love for each one of us. Knowing that was our only hope for redemption and restoration. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You've been bought for a price. A terrible, terrible, unspeakable horror of a price. But also with such love as well. What kind of crazy love is that to love us through this? What kind of crazy love is that to love us through our sin? When we were enemies to Jesus, he died for us. None of us were born knowing him. We had to choose him. That is a crazy kind of love, isn't it? I can't even wrap my brain around it. So, beloved, when was the last time you thanked him for that incredible cost? Of hauling you out of the mud and rescuing you. I just really encourage you this week to just soak in the value that he placed on you. A derelict, broken person. And he placed such value on you. The price he paid to haul you out of that mud. You know, that van was in such a deteriorated state, and it was so full of rats. Uh, Could you show me the next picture? I did not take pictures of the inside. It was just too horrible. It doesn't really show up very well, but it was so... I didn't take a lot of pictures of it because it really broke my heart. But this is totally rusted out from sitting in in a mud river, and this is all mold and mildew, and the interior was so unspeakable and full of yucky stuff. Um, and mildew and all of that kind of thing, you know, and, and hardly anything was usable on it. The tires are only have air in them. It was like about 10 minutes just so we could roll it off the, the truck. Um, and the, our mechanics, after we left it there and then they started looking at it and they called us up and they said, um, you know, we just can't let our staff go in your van until you like clean it out a little bit. So we were like doing this sort of sort of macho hazmat thing with the mask and the 
the uh, shop vac that I, I don't know if we kept that or just threw it away or what exactly happened to that thing. But anyway, um, <laughs> in the process of that, and as they kept the list of things that needed to be replaced on that van kept getting longer and longer and the price, the estimate get, got higher and higher. And we just kind of looked at this thing that was just in horrible condition. And we kept asking ourselves, was it worth it? Is it worth it? Okay, it needs a new, like everything. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Um, and you know, we knew that we would never, ever, unless we met a totally, absolutely crazy person, ever sell this van for what we had invested in it. We, we just knew that, that, that we were just basically throwing away money. But to us, we kept asking ourselves, is it worth it? And the answer was, yeah. It had no value beyond our love for it and beyond our affection for it. Even as much as our family loves this man, none of them would have done this crazy thing that we did. Um, it, it just wasn't even a reasonable thing to do. But the answer, is it worth it, was always yes. It was always, we prayed about it a lot. <laughs> we checked our, are we gonna have to postpone retirement? For this but the answer was always yes and because it was so precious to us we replaced everything in it um, everything mechanical we were able to rescue the cabinets and things that my granddad built but everything mechanical we decided to replace it because we wanted it to be dependable and as we were signing yet another check for our mechanics who by the way are, love us completely um, <laughs> That verse in Ezekiel 36, 26 kept popping up in my brain. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I love how symbolic this restoration of this van is for, for Bob and myself and for you as well. When, G when we ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, God himself spiritually replaces our heart with a heart that resembles his. It resembles his. A heart that beats to love the unlovable and a heart that is moved with the things that moves God's heart. A heart that can move you to things that demonstrate Christ's crazy, unreasonable love. I know you, I know so many of you here, you do crazy, ridiculous things um, in the name of Jesus because that's what God's told you to do, to love your neighbors, to forgive the unforgivable, to forgive yourself when you don't want to or don't think you deserve it. God will give you a heart that will change the direction of your feet and causes your hands to be his hands in this lost and dying world. So what is God moving your heart to do with this new heart that he gives you? What is he moving you to do in this world that is deteriorating very rapidly? We are, we are really deteriorating. I mean, Jesus just needs to come really soon. Really soon, it is so scary what's happening. Bob and I were just talking about how things have changed just in our lifetime, you know? And it's not just about, we were born with black and white TV and now it's, ooh, 3D. It's, it's a whole lot more than that. The morals and everything has just changed and deteriorated so quickly. Does Jesus want you to do something unreasonable? Like reach out to an estranged family member or mentor a child? Give of your financial resources so that others can be sent to share the gospel or go downtown and feed homeless people at night. God gives you the ability to act out Matthew 544 even, which just blows my mind. This is how you know you're saved and you have a new heart in you with Matthew 5.44, to love your enemies. Jesus did. When he was serving Judas communion, he was loving him. When he gave him a place of honor, he was loving him. 
Jesus is telling us to do the same thing, to bless them even, to pray for them, to pray especially for the people that persecute you. That's what a new heart does. That's what a new heart does. What is God speaking to your heart about? If you don't know, ask him. Ask him. You have been bought with a price, and you have been given this new heart for a reason beyond yourself. Well, after the motor and all the mechanicals were done on, on this poor van, <laughs> Um, it, it, it ran actually really great, but it looked just terrible. <laughs> and when I was, um, we took out all of the cabinetry, we just gutted it completely to the walls. It was still uh, quite a treasure trove of stuff in there. Um, and we took all that cabinetry, and I, I just love looking at the cabinetry in it because my granddad basically built it from junk. It was obvious. We didn't realize it because they had a good paint job on it, but he had really put it together with bits and pieces of stuff. And we refinished all of those cabinets and we re-sewed all the curtains. And then we took it to the body shop. So can you show the fifth slide, please? Ooh-wee. It ran good, though. But look at that. It's horrible. It's horrible. It, when I was driving it even to the body shop, People would like jump out of my way. It was so funny. They were like, ah, that thing can't run. But it ran just great, but it looked horrible. And we thought it looked bad before, and now it's like really, I mean, that's really awful, isn't it? If you saw that parked in the drive, a parking lot here, you'd probably, well, you call security. Security, <laughs> check this out. <laughs> um, and even in the process of redoing all of this, it actually became undrivable for a while because we had to take the seats out. So it went, ran great, looked bad, and then it looked worse. And then we, it was even undrivable after all those gigantic checks that we wrote um, because sometimes things in your walk get worse before they get better. That is just a reality of walking with Jesus, because the enemy of your souls wants you to stay this way, because God sees the potential in you and sees what he wants you to do, but the enemy of your souls wants you to give up when you're in this position. You try hard to live your life in a good way, but it seems to get worse, and you keep doing the same sins over and over. Have you ever felt that way? Tell me I'm not the only one. Sometimes I just think, whoa. This is never going to get better. But you know, Bob and I had to, at this point in time, keep a big picture vision. We kept that original picture of Nan and Granddad with that original van. And we kept that big picture and our dream in mind for this van. And I'm so thankful that we can trust our God to see the big picture for us. He sees the end product in what we are to become and what he has predestined since the beginning of time to do for him in his name and for his glory. He knows all the details of what needs to be done, what needs to be patched, what needs to be removed, what needs to be replaced. He always has a picture of the finished product in you. That's what he sees when he looks at you. He doesn't see this. What he sees is you robed in the beautiful robes of righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the way he sees you. He sees you as his beloved child. And, and he gives you victory also and the strength to overcome all the patchworks and the dents and the dings of life. That is our good God. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. We could have given up at this point in time. This was kind of hard to see. This was very emotional for us to see this poor van this way. And we could have given up. We would have wasted a lot of time and money, though. But we kept pressing on, and we kept pressing on. 
but it's easy to lose heart in this world. We have like an instant take a pill society where we want everything to go well. We want to drive through McDonald's and we want to get it right now and we want to get it our way and we're not good at waiting and we're not good at trusting God um, with that. It's easy to lose heart in this world because it seems as though the enemy of our souls is gaining territory, but he's not because we know that God wins. What area are you losing heart in? Let me be really transparent with you. We have two sons. The devil's got his hooks in those boys. It could be crushing to us, and it hurts so bad to see them with the choices they've made. One of them is homeless, living on the streets. The other one is a drug addict. I'm being really transparent with you here. But we know who our God is. We know the promise that God has given us for those young men. We know who God wanted them to be. And we know that God is able. And we will not grow weary and lose heart praying for those children. Well, adults, okay. But you know what I mean. We get it. We get it when you're weary of praying for the same thing. Sometimes I can't even pray for those kids. I have friends who intercede for me because I'm just tired of it. And I'm, sometimes I feel wounded and I just need to recover. But we get it. What are you losing heart in? Are you losing heart in your relationships, in your marriage, in your finances, in your children? We get that. But keep your eye on the prize God wins. God wins. God wins. Don't grow weary. Rest in him. Press on. Colossians 3.2 is such a great reminder. Write this down and meditate on this this week. Colossians 3.2 reminds us to set our minds on the things above, not on the things that are on this earth. If we looked at our son's situations, we would give up. But our eyes are on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Our strength comes not from our own might, but from the joy of the Lord. Let's lay those heartaches at the foot of the cross, shall we? Let's let Jesus carry them. His death and resurrection was enough. Lay them down so you have more energy to run this race. Let's rest in him. I love the verse that we talked about with the kids today. 2 Corinthians 5.17. You remember we were talking about that? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Let me read that again to you. I'm going to emphasize something. So you guys, heads up on this one. If anyone is in Christ, he is. He is. He is. A new creation. The old has gone. And the new has come. I don't see any way you can doubt that. It says is, and what God says goes. And I'm claiming that over you today. Can you show the sixth picture? Thank you. This is, this is the van today. Um, we drove it yesterday to Restoration Ranch, which we thought was fun, uh, the idea of that. And, and we still have this dream. We did finish it. There's still always fine-tuning things that need to be done in a van, but it is drivable and safe and carry it. No longer breaks down. We fixed that problem that you prayed us through. Even the new fuel pump that we put on it was defective. And even after it was, we wrote large checks and, and it looked real purdy. It looked real purdy, broken down on the side of the road a few times. So we did fine-tune that. So we need to keep pressing on with all of this. How we thank God that he has decided that our hunk of junk lives were worth hauling out of the mud. And not only that, Pete, he paid the price for us to be hauled out of the mud. He paid transportation. He paid for all the patchwork. He paid it all. 
so that we could have a new heart to be a new creation and get a complete makeover in the spirit so that we could be part of his amazing plans for others on this earth and for all of eternity. Why did he do that? For no other reason except we're precious to him. He loves us. He said we were worth it. We are that loved by him. We are that valued by him. Glory to God. God says in the book of Revelation several times, he says, come up here. Come up here. He's in heaven. And he says, come up here. And I say that to you today. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, he wants to give you a new heart. He wants to give you a new spirit. He wants to remodel you and restore you. He wants to restore all of your family relationships. He wants to restore the way you think about yourself. You are so precious to him. We're going to stay up here and, and pray for a little while. Can I get the worship team to come on up? God says, come up here. Today, all of us have people in our lives and situations in our lives that we need to lay down at the foot of the cross. Jesus' death was enough for it all. Jesus, we thank you. That's such a stupid word. We can't thank you enough with our words. Oh, let us thank you with our actions. Let us thank you with the lives we impact. Let us thank you with the way that we surrender in obedience to you every day, every moment of every day. For your sacrifice on the cross and for loving us in spite of ourselves and because of ourselves, we love you. In your amazing name we pray. Amen. When the music fades and more is stripped away and I sing Longing just to bring something that's a word that'll bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord for the thing I made it. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. Lord, we can grow. All I have is yours. Every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm 
the prayer team to come up if you would like for someone to pray with you just come up and stand here if you just need some quiet time to just lay those burdens before the Lord and don't want to be disturbed come sit in the pews or kneel at these benches and we will just leave leave you to speak with God alone so and Armando are you still here yep Armando can you run the kids coloring contest for us can you come on up and do that? Thank you. And so yeah, let's go ahead and pray the, uh, play this last song and we get the prayer team to come up and anyone who would like to pray, everyone has something to lay down. Let's do that today before we go home. And I surrender all to you. For the sake of you, my King. 